it's a very powerful time right after a death. And there's just a sense in the room, something bigger is going on. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very quiet time to just sit and kind of sacred in its, in its own way. And I never thought that I would, you know, be in a room where he had just left and we were feeling his family and my brother and I were feeling that that sense of power. It's just a powerful moment. I don't even have good words to, to put to it, except that it's a sense of energy in the room and um, and a sense by everyone present of of such gratitude for the life of the person who has just left. John's first word, interestingly, was light. I can remember him sitting at the kitchen table and pointing up to the overhead light and going, yite, yite. And that was his first word. You know, we were excited because he was saying a word, but we were laughing at him because he said it in a funny way. We would laugh and he would see that we, he made us laugh and then he would say it over and over again. We all went out to eat at this Mexican restaurant and I kept realizing that people at other tables were looking at our table and smiling and laughing a lot. And I thought, why are they laughing at us? You know, is something strange about us? And then we looked at John and he had put his tortilla on his head. <laughs> it, was, it was just like realizing he was getting a rise out of all these people in the restaurant. So he just kept doing it and making faces with his tortilla on his head. That was just classic John. He was always realizing an opportunity to make somebody laugh and milking it for all it was worth. One of the things I remember in high school, John was probably in sixth grade or so, is how he would regale us with these stories during supper. John would start talking about his day and something that someone in his class did he would always sort of bring the story to life by mimicking, all, not in a rude way, but it was he would do the voices of his teacher, of his friends, and so forth. And he was so funny that I don't know how many times that I spit out milk over the kitchen table because he just made me laugh. He would just say something so unexpected or so funny or his take on, on what had happened was so funny. That role he had in our family of fostering conversation and entertaining us with stories of, of life, of his life, of what he'd read, what he'd seen in a movie, were just part of the fabric of our family and, and added to the quality of life of our family. I remember looking at John for the first time as he was laying there in the crib He's looking back at me, he's a baby, and just going, that's a funny looking kid. Well, you know, once he got to one years old, and I'll never forget that first year, we celebrated with a chocolate cake, one single candle lit. The first thing John did was stare at the candle. And I remember noticing that he was mesmerized by it. And then he just stuck his finger in the flame and I went, What's he doing? And he just held it there, didn't do anything, and then moved it off. And I was yelling at my parents, John's sticking his finger in the fire. I learned from that. You know, that's the first thing I learned from John. You can put your finger in the flame as long as you pull it out in time. Might have been the first year I was at Chowan College. I wanted to get to the Outer Banks to surf. I knew there was going to be waves. I think I found a ride. They got me as far as Nag's Head with my board. My wetsuit, I'm not sure I even packed any clothes. I'm not sure I had any money. I just, my only goal was to get there and get out and surf. And when he dropped me off, it was getting dark. It was chilly, kind of cold, windy. Surf was out of control. I didn't have a plan after that. I was sitting on a pier, wondering what to do, where am I gonna sleep? And realizing I had screwed up. This wasn't a good idea. 
and I didn't have any way back to the college, which is a good two, two and a half hours away. And I kind of ran out of options and panicked and called my dad. I didn't know what else to do. And I've just told dad, I'm in trouble. I'm here in Nag's head. Don't know what to do. All of a sudden he goes, John's willing to come get you. Because John knows that all he has to do is borrow the car, the Volkswagen Rabbit. Dad probably gave him a 20 and said, go save your brother. Threw his board and wetsuit in the car and he flew there. And I sat there in that pier house going, it's okay, my brother is on his way. It took him five hours, but he showed up. We drove down to Buxton. I think we went on to Frisco and we probably just slept in the car. And the surf was really good down there the next day. And he and I just had a great time surfing over this past August. I kind of forced the issue because I live out here in California and I don't get to see my brother and sister that much. And they were all busy traveling and doing this. And I thought, no, no, you got at this age, you don't skip years. And I said, look, I'm coming, you know. So we threaded the needle and we found three days we could all hang out at John's house and carry, you know, with John and family. And we had a great time. We would stay up, sipping wine, talking all kinds of stuff, talking about music, playing all, you know, John's favorite music, we played a lot of Beatles. Thank God we did that. That was the last time we were able to do that. You know, there was one point where my sister and I were hanging out in the backyard where John didn't know where we didn't, we thought he was working and he didn't know we were there. Otherwise he would have hung out with us. And finally he comes out and goes, there you are. I was looking everywhere for you, you know, and it probably, he didn't know where we were for like 30 or 40 minutes. And my sister, after he died, she's going, I feel so terrible that he didn't know where we were then. We should have told him that's precious John time we lost out on. That's how, you know, it feels after somebody, you know, you care about leaves. Every, every moment is precious. There'll be a lot said about John's um, accomplishments in science, technology, um, but what I'd like, and business, but what I'd like to do is mention what a uh, creative guy, a really funny guy, and the greatest of friends he was. I met John when he was 17 and living, 16 or 17, and living at the coast. He had borrowed his parents' uh, pop-up camper and decided to live at the beach for the summer. He'd uh, surf during the day and he would uh, cut meat at the local grocery. The first time I, uh, first conversation I remember having with John is uh, he walks up to me and he holds up his hand and he goes, uh, Hey man, don't don't buy the ground beef today. He goes, I had a Band-Aid when I came in this morning to work and now I don't. And um, John was always a creative guy, a good cook and creative in many different ways. Uh, when you would visit him at his uh, camper for hot dogs, first thing he would do is he'd hand you a head of lettuce and a bottle of salad dressing and uh, that was it, that was the first course. And you were expected to pour a little uh, dressing on the head of lettuce, take a bite, and pass it on to the next guy. It was mostly guys. So if you think about it, that, even back then, that was an engineer's solution to the problem of salad. Just a bottle of salad dressing and a head of lettuce. It was uh, many years later that my uh, girlfriend and I, John and Nancy, um, we're at uh, Yosemite Park in California on vacation. One morning, John goes into the main lodge and walks up to the ranger station and uh, he goes, uh, hey guys, he goes, uh, I know it's been dry, but what time today do you turn on the waterfalls? And uh, all the young rangers gathered around and they were in a big hurry to tell him that, well, you know, man, it's like uh, a function of rainfall and snow melt. It's, uh, like an act of nature, you know? Uh, so John, during his life, received many awards, proud of all of them and rightfully so. But I think the thing he was most proud of is finding out on the internet that the staff at uh, Yosemite had nominated his question as the most silly question they had ever received. That really made him happy.
John had lots of friends, a wide range of friends in high and low places. He had friends who were sometimes food insecure, housing insecure. Some of them may have had substance problems. At the same time, he had friends who were heads of corporations, uh, who lived in mansions and preferred to fly on private planes. But what I can say, and you can take this to the bank, is if John was ever your friend, it was really hard for him to not be your friend. He always watched out for you and uh, took care of you. And so I'd like to say on behalf of myself and for so many people, John, you are now and you always will be my friend. Uh, it's hard to express how important John was in my life as a business partner and dear close friend. I loved him like a brother. We met in 1981 when he was an undergrad and I was in graduate school in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at NC State. I knew his dad, Hain, a professor in our department, even before I met John. Hain was on my graduate advisory committee. Among JP's most endearing qualities were his amazing sense of humor and quick wit. It was this and our mutual fondness for alcohol that cemented our friendship. It was fun watching John grow from being a relatively lazy graduate student to becoming one of the hardest working people I know. He had many great qualities that made him a great engineer, scientist, and innovator, but probably the most important were his tenacity and can-do attitude. The obstacles he had to overcome while developing silicon carbide power devices sometimes seemed insurmountable, but he never gave up. He is the main reason Wolfspeed exists and is so successful today. John had a bit of a competitive streak. At a conference we attended in Trieste, Italy in 1992, he challenged a recent Russian recruit to a vodka drinking competition. John won the competition because Vladimir ended the evening losing his vodka to the Adriatic Sea while JP held his until late the next morning. John and I were neighbors on Wrightsville Beach for 18 years. We had lots of fun times there. JP was known for his ability to hang partying. Oftentimes, my family would wake up the next morning after an evening of partying and see him asleep in a chair on his porch, still holding a beer. Several times we enjoyed what we called pots and pansing him, startling him awake. JP and I sat beside one another at NC State basketball games since the RBC Center opened in 1999. We cheered on the pack and yelled at the refs until, they were, until we were hoarse. We both also loved going to NC State football games, especially the tailgating. We always went out at halftime for a drink or two, and sometimes we forgot to go back in the game. Neither John nor I were very good golfers, but we enjoyed playing in tournaments. One of our favorite tournaments was the Jimmy V Celebrity Golf Classic. One funny memory is when John calls Coach Terry Bowden to dive out of his golf cart as JP drove his ball right through it. John was a major driving force behind Cree having such epic holiday and silicon carbide conference parties. One of my favorite memories is when he arrived at one of the holiday parties dressed as a waiter, serving drinks, and wearing a table. He was also well known for his ability to flip women, literally. I told you. And bringing his water balloon launcher to Cree holiday parties in high-rise hotels. John was somewhat of a daredevil. I remember watching him and his brother Hain boulder hop near San Diego, nearly giving John Edmund and I a heart attack. And the time he was sitting on the window ledge of a high rise hotel in Kyoto at, a, at an after party and climbing up and dancing on the rooftop of a hotel in Grand Cayman. I loved hanging out with John. We traveled to conferences all over the world together, sharing hotel rooms and almost always sitting together on flights. We shared lunch tables at the Cree Nerd Table, met for beers after work, and we both loved Cree and the Wolfpack. John was one of my dearest and closest friends, and I sure do miss him. It's been an honor and a privilege 
to have been a good friend and a colleague of John's for the last 39 years, four years at NC State in graduate school, in the last 35 years together at uh, Wolf Speed Cree. He always said of the founding uh, members that we were his brother from another mother, and that's the way he said it. And I got lots of stories um, over those years, what I really want to do is to offer a message of hope. On the 19th of November, six days after John left this world, another good friend and, and Wolf Speed colleague came over to the house and we were reminiscing about the times with John. And being a good Southern Baptist boy, he said, do you know where JP was in his faith journey? And not knowing, my buddy said, you know what gives me a lot of comfort the message from Good Friday, when Jesus was on a cross and it was two criminals. And one of the criminals, knowing that his time was up, he could change nothing, simply said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' response was, today you will be with me in paradise. It's a beautiful story of hope, mercy, and love. And I told that story to to Nancy and she said you know John in those five weeks when John was in a hospital bed and he knew he could do nothing to change the situation he was in I truly believe that he made peace with his maker and that brings comfort to all of us but the story doesn't end there so the next morning I went to mass and time for the reading the priest opened up the Bible and the reading of the day was the story of the cross and the two criminals. And I about fell out of my pew. Then the priest went on to give a sermon. And the sermon was about the relationship between the man who was dying and God. And the beautiful story of mercy and hope and forgiveness and love. And it really, I was like, oh my goodness. I need to go out and check Google and find out how many verses are in the Bible because what are the chances of me hearing the same verses within a 24-hour period in the same message? So I found out there's over 31,000 verses in the Bible. So the chances are extremely small that it was by chance. Was it a coincidence? Maybe. But I want to think and I want to believe that my brother from another mother was telling us all that he's doing great. He's doing just fine. And I look forward to the day when the two of us can raise a glass in paradise and talk about the dream that he had, that silt and carbide would someday change the world and make it a better place for all of us. And that in fact, that dream did come true. So here's to John Williams Palmer, salute day. You know, I first met JP at a dinner that I had hosted for the for the leadership team when I joined Cree. And, you know, we shared a little bit of a background about each other, you know, and so forth. And um, and after we got through that, JP looked at me and he said, I've got I've got a question for you. I said, What's that? He said, What color? I said, What color what? And he said, What color jersey do you root for? And apparently in uh, in the Triangle area, that's kind of a thing here. It's either Duke or NC State or Carolina Blue and this whole thing. And I, I wasn't aware of this whole thing. And so I looked at him and I said, well, I don't know which color, but um, I typically root for the underdog. And he jumped up out of his uh, chair and he goes, NC State. So I, I was, he, he was happy about that, which was uh, uh, fun. And you know, I thought to myself, this guy's got a lot of energy. He's got a lot of energy. The very next day, I did a one-on-one -on -one with him. And, he, and as he sat down, he says, I've just got one question for you. I go, well, we already talked about the color of the jerseys. And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, uh, I want to know why you chose to come here. And I looked at him and I said, because we're going to convert the high power semiconductor market from silicon to silicon carbide. And he jumped up out of his chair again, gave me a high five, and he goes, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. And I thought to myself, he not only has energy, but he's got passion for, for this technology. And it was really a beautiful thing to witness. 
But it's not just his you know, knowledge and business breadth that he had, but he had an amazing um, kindness in him. He connected with people incredibly well. And um, you know, I think everybody knows he had also an incredible witty sense of humor. So uh, it was always fun to hang out with him. Unfortunately, not all of us have you know what, what he had, but um, you know, one interesting thing is I mean, you meet a lot of people who are you know good with people, um, technically okay, but not as as sharp and astute as as John was. When you met John to talk about a topic, very quickly, minutes into it, he will build this trust with with the people that he interacts with, and um, that will, you know, inevitably led to uh, lifelong relationships that he has uh, in in the industry. He was really unique, and he was really known for this. Till his passing, uh, we were literally in adjacent offices with him. It's a really a mixture of an incredibly talented colleague, but also a incredibly compassionate friend being right next door to you all day long. So I will absolutely will miss that. On the other hand, I feel pretty lucky that I spent so much time with him, both uh, in the company and traveling. His um, friendship will be missed. Um, incredibly we'll keep it up as best as we can and um, you know reflect back on our learnings from john when i first started actually working for john he'd never had an executive assistant before he didn't know what to do with me and it took years of kind of getting him used to me trusting me he would do everything himself so i kind of played the long game with him and we joked about it <laughs> um, just to be able to get him to trust me to to do things, but then once he did, it's like once he trusted you, you were all in. John was incredible. He was always the smartest person in the room. Um, he never made you feel dumb, ever. Probably one of my favorite things about John was um, his use of curse words. I curse a lot and he curses way more than me. <laughs> so I, I never, you know, felt bad about cursing. I just felt like I fit right in. He was definitely larger than life. Anybody that met him loved him. And they would always say to me, oh, I met John, he's so nice, or he's so cool, he's so fun. And I would say, well, what did you think? He was gonna be a, a jerk? Like, <laughs> he's just a guy just like you, you know? And they're like, yeah, but he's like so important at work. And I said, he puts his pants on just like you. He's propping his feet up on the table and there's holes in his shoes and I'm, you know, telling his wife to buy him new shoes. I mean, he just was, he was a regular guy. He was somebody that you wanted to be your friend. Um, you wanted him in your corner. I mean, I just feel so lucky that I got to have him in my life and that I got to learn from him and just, you know, have him as a mentor, have him as a boss, have him as a friend. Um, he always had something funny to say, especially when life got hard. Um, I remember my husband was stuck in Argentina at the beginning of the pandemic. I sent John an email and I said, you know, hey, here's what's going on. Damien's stuck in Argentina and he, his reply back was, do you want me to come over and put dirty dishes in the sink and fart? <laughs> and so, to me, that just encompasses John. My freshman year, one Sunday night, he was driving me back to Chapel Hill by coming home on the weekend and making him drive me over to UNC. That was kind of just rubbing his face in it, but um, I was not having a great time that year. You know, when you don't have a clear goal, I guess, the that makes the workload kind of difficult to, to bear. But uh, so I just unloaded on him about, you know, how frustrated I was at, at school that year. And I think his response was, well, you know, it's it's like the NCAA tournaments, you know, survive in advance. And I just, in that moment, I just wanted to like smack him. I was like, sh you know, shut up about the NCAA tournament. This, you know, this is my life, whatever. Um, but he went on to say something along the lines of, you know, anytime you're doing anything difficult or worthwhile or whatever, you're going to have moments where you think to yourself, I don't belong here, I'm not cut out for this. And I don't really even remember what the conclusion of that thought was, but 
I could tell that he was speaking from experience. That was not a way that I had ever really thought of my dad before. Um, obviously, given how successful he was, hadn't really crossed my mind before that he had just struggled with obviously how much work it was to, to get Cree and, and Wolf Speed off the ground, but just like kind of confidence as well. Um, so I think back on that conversation pretty frequently and it was kind of the first thing that surfaced and the thing that I keep coming back to when I think about anecdotes that kind of describe who he was. Um, he didn't embarrass me directly, but there was one time in kindergarten where I was having to tell the class about my weekend or something like that. And that weekend or something, I had had to wear like a suit. And so I was telling the class that like, oh, I had to wear a monkey suit because that's what he called it. Whenever he had to wear a suit for work, he called it he like, oh, I've got to wear a monkey suit, whatever. He, so I was telling the class that, yeah, I had to wear a monkey suit. And they're like, oh, like, you mean you had to dress up like a monkey? I'm like, no, I, I had to wear a monkey suit. You know, like, you know, a monkey suit. And it just went back and forth. And finally, I realized that not that most people don't call it that. That night when he got home for work, I, I was just screaming at him like, why did you like, why did you not tell me that not everyone calls it that? Like, you had me thinking that that was a normal thing to say. And in a similar vein, there are just a lot of there were a lot of words that he pronounced weirdly, like he would say arugula instead of arugula. So I would go around calling it arugula. I don't think working hard came naturally to him, just from stories I've heard about uh, heard about his high school and early undergrad career. I think it came from. I don't know, partially peer pressure, not wanting to let his teammates down. I think it was just something he learned from facing a lot of really challenging situations in grad school and beyond. He was boisterous and very smart, too smart. He could not help but be himself, which was sort of like a 10-year-old boy oftentimes stuck in the body of a larger 62-year-old genius engineer. <laughs> Outside of being an engineer, he had so many interests and he still partied a lot, even in his adulthood. My dad was full of potty humor and, you know, he would do impressions of people which was just the funniest thing. I thought it was epic when he would do some like really theatrical karaoke performance. Should I stay or should I go now? All stuff that started to really embarrass me as a teenager, but back then it was cool and now is cool. He took me to bed every night as a kid. As busy as he was, he piggybacked me upstairs and would read to me and lie there until I fell asleep. So we had lots of little conversations and I would ask him my burning questions like, will American Idol still be around when I'm old enough to audition? To which he would respond, absolutely not. When we would go through the McDonald's drive through and they would of course be out of ice cream, he would sternly say, You've not only broken my heart, but the hearts of my children. He drove me to high school every morning because it was on his way to work. So he made me late countless times because he forgot I was in the car and blew right past my exit and just headed straight to work. He always had a really strong memory of all the vocabulary that we created as kids. And he was a big one for inside jokes. I think that's what people are probably surprised about that he'll remember something they laughed about, you know, 25 years ago. He didn't talk about work all that often when I was really little, or if he did, I just didn't understand it. He wouldn't really bring the, his stress home too much, which was good. I didn't really fully understand what he did until I interned at Cree one summer in college. And I really just 
got to see how big this thing he had built really was. There were definitely times growing up where it was challenging and where work was coming first, but seeing firsthand everything he had on his shoulders made me realize how hard it must have been to balance. I also got to see how happy he was, which is being happy at work is one of the coolest things you can achieve in life. When COVID hit, I was living at home after college and I got some of that really valuable time back with my dad. I would help him film cooking videos for all of the elaborate dinners he made and he would help me with the daily crossword puzzle and truly some of those boring days stuck indoors were some of the best. There never could have been enough time for me to soak up all of the wisdom and experiences and humor that I wanted to from my dad. I'm devastated, but grateful for all the time that I did have and just truly can't believe how lucky I was and am to have had him. It seemed like he always wanted to make someone laugh. Whether if it was like just a simple joke or maybe like him being clumsy, he would show that he was in a good mood to everyone and just like kind of wants everyone to know that and uh, wants to help everybody like meet at his level, I guess, of happiness. As much as that he is, he was a serious person when it came to certain things. Like if he needed his point across, he would let you know. As a dad, he was always thinking of something for us to be doing, wanting us to be in. It could be we're going to someplace over the summer and everything's set up, all these uh, activities. He just, he wants, he wants time filled for us to do stuff. It's so easy to tell that he loved everyone in the family, that he just wanted us to be happy. I'm thinking a lot about how, like, when I was super young, every time he would come home from work, and, like, he used to have a big beer belly, just a really big one, and he would come home from work, and I would just, like, run into his stomach. And what amazed me was that he allowed me to do that and just, like, basically punch his stomach every, like, every night he came home from work. He was really loving to let me just punch his stomach every night behind all the work stuff when he is not working. He just wanted to have a good time. I feel like he did a good job at doing that. He really just enjoyed every second. He never wanted to quit work. And when he wasn't working, he would always be doing something he enjoys. I feel like there's nothing he didn't accomplish, really. He got a lot done. I feel like he's happy. We met, it was my second year at State, and I lived in a house with four other girls not far from campus on Gardner Street. And two guys always, they rented the house to two guys because the guys were supposed to take care of the girls upstairs and walk them back and forth to campus and because it was five blocks. So John was good friends with one of the guys downstairs. So whenever we had gatherings at our house, John would show up because there were five girls upstairs. And so that's how we met. Oh, oh, you mean the, the story. The story. <laughs> I had gone to a, I guess, a keg party at John's apartment. My roommates all went. At some point, they decided they, they were ready to go. And I decided, I think I need to stick around a little bit. And so John said, oh, I'll take you home. I'll, I'll drive you home. And at some point, they decided we needed to go outside and play Red Rover. And it was really cold. The ground was frozen, and when I got sent over, I didn't make it through. So I was kind of hanging, and 
John and his buddy, I believe Joe, let go and I just fell, fell right on my knee and um, dislocated my knee. So I was, you know, I popped it back because I just, it looked horrible. But it, then it started swelling and <laughs> John must have gone in and chugged beer or something because he got really drunk and then he fell asleep. So there was nobody to take me home except for his good friend, Mark, from Winston-Salem. So Mark drove me home, made sure I got in the house and was very kind. But then I started dating John after that. <laughs> What's something that you don't think most people knew about? Uh, that he's very sentimental. Well, his, his dad passed away in um, January of 17, I believe. So on that date, every, every year after that, John will sit in his office after he's finished working and pour two glasses of bourbon and sit there and he says he's having a drink with his dad. He did it every year. He definitely worked a lot. He spent a lot of time at work. But when he was at work, he was all in at work. And when he got home, he was all in at home. So that's how he did it. What do you think John's legacy was? John's legacy is silicon carbide power semiconductors. Oh my God, he was the silicon carbide champion of the world. I think his legacy is very, very broad. Like every single day, something else was a complete new goal that he wanted to get done, and he would fight towards it. He would not let it go. Do I consider John a modern day Thomas Edison? I think in some ways, yes, because look what's happening. So I don't, I don't think he took himself too seriously which kind of, uh, I guess, helps capture the breadth of what we had here. He, he, was a, he was a unique person. He was just so humble. Even when he got inducted into the National Academy of Engineering, he was like, no way. Who, who nominated me for this? Are you sure they got the right person? So the world are all learning to that. What, what were you <laughs> Being one of the most fun people to be around I've ever met. He'll always be someone that I really enjoyed being around. His personality and sense of humor were still coming through right until the end, and I would like to think that's something that kind of lives on to some extent in anyone who knew him. I really think it's uh, a personal friendships that will uh, outlive him. All his friends that he made are lifelong. What is it that you miss most about John right now? Mm. Well, we have a beach house right next to his. We were there this weekend. His wife and his kids came over and we talked and we laughed and we cried and we drank. And John's not there. And he was always there. I'm gonna miss it. I'm gonna miss it a lot. It's, uh, it's really a mixture of uh, his intellect and his friendship. It will be uh, missed uh, dearly. And I really miss that he's gonna miss the opportunity to see where we're gonna take this thing. I know he's gonna be watching from heaven, uh, but I would, would have loved to have been arm in arm with him as we take our next step in this journey. I keep thinking that I can call him or text him. I just love spending time with the guy. Wow, that's a hard one. Um, I think what a funny guy he was. He, he just made other people laugh. He's very much still here and I don't think it's because he passed recently. I think it's because of the kind of guy he was. I will always feel that way. I'm pretty sure of that. And I don't think I'm alone in that. I, I can't think of hardly any situation where he couldn't find the humor in it. And if you can find the humor in any situation, you, sh you can usually get through it, even if it's not the outcome you want, but you can endure it. We'll really miss his help on little things like helping me drill a hole in the wall. I don't know how I'm gonna do things like that without him. I bothered him all the time. I'll miss his laugh 
so much, particularly when I'm just sitting there watching TV and he'll walk in, you know, I would be like nine watching Hannah Montana and he would stand there for a second acting like he wasn't gonna commit to watching it and he would laugh at Hannah Montana. He would laugh hard. Just his presence, um, it feels odd. As much as I was used to it when he would go out on like business trips, after a bit it started to set in. It, was, it feels like a part of you is kind of gone. I miss being able to tell him about things going on in my life that I'm excited about. We weren't ready. <laughs> In no way, shape, or form were we ready to let go of him. John was the best brother any guy could ask for. How are you processing right now? Hmm. I'm not sure that I am. I don't think I've gotten there yet. Yeah, that was my thing that I've been missing more as time goes on is just, you know, he had an app on his phone, you know, find your phone, and so it would alert me when he left work. So I always love hearing that tone and looking at my phone and just watching his phone get closer and closer to mine at home and getting excited about him. And then another tone when he, he arrived. And that's something that I'm really gonna miss. I'll just miss him coming home. But the one lesson I think I finally got after he passed away is don't waste time. Life is short. Life can be short. And I think I've adopted, after he left, I adopted that. Like, I would put something off or think, eh, maybe I shouldn't do that. And I thought, I didn't what John would say. I wouldn't what he would say to me now. He would say, do it. I mean, I think everybody's gonna honor his legacy. We're gonna try to embody John. Have that extra drink, have that pickle back. Maybe that's four letter words. Go have 10 coffees in the morning if that's what you need to, to get to work, but you know, be brave, believe in something and convince others to believe in it with you.